This is Auto Line This Week, the show that gets you inside the global automotive industry. Auto Line This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode. Hi, I'm John McElroy, and welcome to Auto Line This Week. You know, I've always thought that the automotive industry might be one of the most regulated industries in the world. I had no idea. That's what we're going to be talking about today. The laws and regulations that affect the automotive industry. Might sound boring right now, but believe me, you're going to find this fascinating. And I've got two experts who have just written a book about automotive law that are joining me on today's program, including Kevin McDonald and Carl Hockhammer. And thanks for being here, you guys. Uh, you have written a book called Automotive Law 101. And just so the audience understands what kind of regulations and laws we're talking about, there are chapters devoted to laws that regulate engineering and distribution, marketing and advertising, sales, finance, customer data privacy, warranty, product liability, how to raise capital, and there's some new ones coming as well as new technology comes into the industry. So, Kevin, let me just start with you. Why did you write this book? Sure. Uh, thanks for having us on the show, John. We're thrilled to be here. Um, the way we approached this subject was to think about the life cycle of an automobile from creation in your mind to all the way at the end. And so we wanted to make it simple enough, 100, Automotive Law 101, 101 answers to commonly asked questions, but structured around what do you have to think about if you're engineering a car? What do you have to think about if you are producing it? If you're then distributing it or importing it and then selling it to the dealer and then financing it at the dealer and then repairing the vehicle and after sales activity. And then how do you provide the funding for all of that on the capital market? So that's roughly the way we, we structured the chapters, as you mentioned. And one of the reasons that drove us to this is that we saw a, throughout the course of our career, a lot of questions coming at us that seemed to kind of be perhaps repetitive over the years as we have new people coming to the industry, or even executives coming to us who may not have the background that we have. And so instead of just saying to someone, hey, what's NHTSA, we'll go to the website and find out, we wanted to position where NHTSA might fit in, for example, in the life cycle of a vehicle or the CFPB or EPA and so on. That way, when someone has a question, they can get it answered quickly in a page and a half, but they can also see where that particular question fits in the life cycle of that vehicle. Carl, how'd you get involved in it? Well, so Kevin, Kevin and I have worked together for, for many, many years, um, and, and Kevin and I you know, uh, teach teach some classes on consumer protection law, automotive law, and uh, you know we're both very interested in these things, and we talk about it all the time. And so uh, Kevin asked me to work with him on, on co-authoring the book, which I, which I was thrilled to do. Um, you know, from a, you know, for, for, from our perspective in writing the book, we, you know, we were trying not to make it, you know, super hyper technical from a legal perspective. You know, you know, the, the intended audience is, you know, regular people, not necessarily a lawyer. Uh, and the other thing that is important, I think, you know, in looking at the, what we did in the book, you know, we very specifically, you know, tried to avoid what I call, you know, supply chain contracting matters, where you know an OEM goes out. In contracts with the supplier to, you know, design, manufacture, and supply a part. Um, a lot of what we are really kind of focused on in our book is is looking at the automotive industry from the consumer perspective. Of you know, these are all the things that you know go into, you know, how a car is manufactured, sold, financed, serviced, um, really to the consumer. So so we tried to make this, you know, very digestible and frankly relevant to you know sort of the regular regular person. Yeah, but the scope of what you've covered here is extraordinary. There's so many different topics, so many different laws, so many different questions that you all address. Uh, you know, Kevin, how did you collect all this different uh, information about the law? You know, a lot of it, John, is is based on questions that, that we've gotten over the years in our careers. Well, Carl and I have been at this uh, 50 years plus, to, if you add up our time together. Um, and we, we, we've seen some questions just kind of pop up as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, as people come to us, John, whether they're out of college or grad school, if they're new into the company, or as I said, if they're laterals and they may have experience in the tech industry, but not automotive, or 
and also, often in my cases where we have senior executives from Germany who are absolute experts in their area, but they come over to the company and they have no idea what a lemon law is, or they have no idea, you know, what what how, how recalls are governed, or how what, what does fair lending mean? And so, um, I've taken you know notes over the years on how I can prepare presentations, uh, both internally and externally, and. Uh, you know, when you look back over your career, you think there's there, there there seems to be some repetitive patterns here, and so I wanted to kind of structure that in a way for a broader audience who may be interested in these subjects or may want to know about these subjects, in a way that they can they can quickly go and get get uh, their question answered, but then also see how that fits in again to that overall life cycle of the vehicle because everything kind of fits together when you take that 30,000 foot view and, and look down over that regulatory landscape that is, as you mentioned, very, very uh, complicated. But Carl, you must have had a checklist and you know, I, I read all the different chapters that you had. You, you, you guys must have been going back and forth for trying to figure out if you had missed something or not. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, honestly, Ke Kevin is the one who took the lead on coming up with, with the 101 uh, uh, you know, frequently asked questions here. Um, but what we, what, you know what we were trying to do in organizing the, the way that the chapters are laid as we tried to kind of put it in into you know topical areas because a lot of this stuff kind of overlaps and intersects in very surprising ways and so you know because frankly in the us we tend to legislate and regulate in reaction to problems in, in the marketplace um, you know there, there it it becomes complicated. You know, there's no like one overarching law or set of regulations that really, you know, govern any of this. Uh, and so, you know, again, looking at this, you know, we were, Kevin and I were just trying to think about, you know, you know, what are the types of questions that we we have heard over, over, over the years? We, we certainly miss some things that, you know, they're, they're, you know, you know, it would be just an encyclopedia if you tried to cover absolutely everything um, and in depth. But again, if the, the intention is, to provide an overview of kind of the complexity of it and a starting point uh, for people who have interest in, in a you know particular topic, you know we we you know try not to oversight the book with legal citations and things, but you know frankly what we provided we think is enough that if somebody is interested in this, you know they've got a, a bit, little bit of a roadmap to just start googling if, if nothing else. Yeah. Carl, how long did it take you to put the book together? Um, it, it it well we we're doing this sort of in our spare time. I think it took what, Kevin, a year and a half or so? I think it was about a year and a half, John. It tended to be the pandemic project, you know, as, <laughs> as we were grounded and not flying as much and we wanted to be active in automotive, you know, things outside of work. This kind of lended itself to that. And so uh, it was a it was a perfect sort of project to, to you know, do in the, in the home study. Right. Yeah, and, but even so, I mean, uh, you know, I, uh, there's colleagues of mine in the media who have written books and they usually take like a three month hiatus from work to be able to go work on it. So it's amazing that you guys have put this together in only a year and a half. Well, one of the nice things about being in a law firm is, you know, we, we, we have summer law students, you know, typically a law student, um, you know, who's between their second and third year uh, of law school. And, you know, they come and work at a firm like mine. Um, you know, it's really sort of, an, you know, it's a paid internship. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I had two um, summer associates who were very interested in this and agreed to help uh, Chase Yarber and uh, uh, Quasi, who was, was referenced in, in the um, uh, the preface. And, and you know, both of them, you know, really built on what Kevin and I put together, and you know, you know, did, did some additional detailed research, citations, and things like that. So mm -hmm. we did have some help, which was very much appreciated. Yeah, but still, Kevin, this is not a cut and paste kind of a book. You didn't just find copies of laws and and paste them in. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're interpreting things, you're, you're putting uh, mm -hmm. things in context, different topics in context and the like. How did you go through all that? Well, one of the things that we looked at and Carl and I would, would talk about these uh, issues from time to time was, OK, well, here, here's the black letter law. And how have we seen it over our careers? Where have we seen it playing out, uh, play play out either in in uh, car with Carl and his clients or, or mine and my clients over the years? So if you take an entry on say warranty law. Well, well, what, what are some of the famous cases in warranty law or, or how have we seen it play out recently um, in contracts that we've governed or, 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 or what have you? Obviously not disclosing uh, confidential information, but you, there's general principles that you can take, John, to, uh, to kind of summarize in a, in a page or two what we're talking about. And that was also something we were very insistent on. We didn't, we didn't want to make this overly complex because the topic itself is so broad 
but a lot of the entries lend themselves to at least um, a page or a page and a half of, of brief explanation that we think will answer some of the questions, hopefully a lot, that people might have just to satisfy their curiosity. And there are enough endnotes um, in it that if somebody wants to drill down deeper, they can certainly do that. But the principal point of the book was really to just kind of um, you know, answer those first level questions that people may have if they're just trying to figure out what, I mean, where they are in, in, in the question that they have and how that fits into where the vehicle is, frankly. And that, that was kind of how we wanted to anchor it. How does this fit into to what the consumer might see from, from the vehicle um, life cycle? Yeah, you're right. Uh, there's there's plenty of footnotes and endnotes to each chapter in this. But Carl, you're a lawyer. The, one of the mm -hmm. things that so impressed me about this book is it's highly readable. You didn't degenerate into legalese as a lawyer. How would you avoid the temptation to do that? Well, I mean, I, you know, I'll be honest with you. That's that's kind of one of the things that I, I pride myself on, and this is and, and Kevin is excellent at this too. I mean, we spend most of our time, you know, in our professional lives working with non-lawyers. And, and a lot of what we are doing is, I would say, to some degree, translating. I mean, we're taking these legal concepts, these regulatory concepts, and we're trying to turn it into plain English to, you know, advise our clients, talk to our executives about, you know, why we should do, you know, something or not do something or what our options are, or what the risks are. And so, you know, over, 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 you know, 25 years of practice, you know, both Kevin and I, frankly, have gotten pretty good at that, we think. And, you know, I think that's what you see in the writing. Yes, it's very easy to write, you know, a highly technical sort of legal, legal memo. Um, it's very difficult to take a highly technical legal memo and distill it into a page and a half of prose that's intended to be readily understandable by anybody. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's frankly kind of fun uh, to, to do that. That's, it's a little, you know, writing at this level of detail is... You know, not not something we always do in the normal day to day course. Um, if if you look up, if you Google Kevin, for example, you know Kevin is a prolific author. He's written books and articles um, on you know a myriad of, of legal topics for a myriad of, of legal audiences. I mean, you know, frankly, for Kevin, it's fun. Um, for me, it's fun too. But I, I think it's a lot of fun for Kevin. Now, I'm, I'm not going to call it bedtime reading. But anybody can read this book, and it and it's interesting. I mean, it gets you engaged in in all, all that. So, kudos to you guys on on how you all did that. Well, John, it might it might be bedtime reading depending on your interests, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, depends well, on the chapter. Let, Kevin, let's give the audience you know a little bit of an example. W sure. One thing that caught my attention as I was going through it is the difference between puffery and false advertising. And you guys cited the example of Ford using the claim built Ford tough and they got sued over it. So good, just give us a little bit of the background between puffery and false advertising. Sure. It's, it's, it, and this, this is the type of example that comes out of the automotive industry. And this is a, this is also a larger principle, which is kind of interesting, uh, John, that you picked that one because there's many of them and these types of issues, although they, they are, you can, you can find lots of automotive uh, applications of it. They have larger implications for the overall legal community. So in this particular example, yeah. it really is indicative or um, illustrative, uh, illustrative of the difference between uh, a, a dealer saying or, 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 or a company saying what their opinion of a product is versus what they're trying to stand behind when it comes to a, uh, an affirmation of a particular fact of that of the quality or feature of a product. And the law is very generous toward uh, the, the, the former as opposed to the latter. In other words, you can give your opinion all the time and say, hey, this is the best car that I've ever got on my lot here. You can you, you know, take it, for, take it for a spin. You'll love it. It's the greatest car ever. And you're not going to be held to account for creating a warranty or a false representation. But if you get a little more specific and you, you drill down on that and, and, and give uh, something along the lines of, say, that, well, this vehicle uh, went through 101 inspection with, you know, on the, and it passed every single one, and here's the safety features that it does, and then you can't deliver on that, well, that's, that's moving out of puffery um, and into uh, types of descriptions and declarations of fact that the law will kind of come down on you if you can't deliver. Yeah. And Carl, let me ask you this. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm looking for an opinion or your thoughts on it. You guys get into... Uh, you know, dealerships and the like. Now we're seeing EV startups like Tesla pulling an end run around the, the dealer franchise uh, uh, laws. Uh, how do you think that's going to turn out? I think, I, well, I think that's a big question in terms of how that's going to turn out. Uh, because frankly, it's, it's, it's really coming down to becoming a political issue. Uh, you know, the, the, 
you know, they're, they're, you know, all states have, um, you know, statutes, franchise statutes that, that protect the dealer franchise for, from the manufacturer. Um, and that, you know, it, it has been the result of, you know, I would say, you know, depending on your view on it, historical bad conduct where, where the dealers needed protection from the manufacturers um, to protect their franchise. And, you know, now you've got, you know, dealers who, you know, are, are very protective of, of their franchise rights. And you have, you know, especially these new, these new auto companies um, that are looking at a way to, you know, I would say, you know, have, have more control over, I would say, the consumer experience. Um, and so there's a tension. And I mean, you saw that, you know, with the, um, you know, the, the fights that Tesla's had, you know, at various states, you know, throughout the country to be able to, to market directly. Uh, you know, there's obviously news that comes out, um, you know, you know, with Ford, it, it has made some statements about how, you know, it, some of the, you know, the dealer relationships may change, not necessarily go away. So I think we're going to have to see, um, but, but that, you know, from a, from my perspective as the lawyer advising clients who operate in that space, I mean, the, these are issues that are very much at the forefront and, you know, need, need to be taken into consideration, um, you know, all the time. So, so they, they remain, they may be old laws, but they remain very relevant, which, yeah. which is something you can say about a lot of the topics that we covered in the book. Mm -hmm. Kevin, yeah, pick, pick that up. You know, here's Ford uh, really wanting to change the way it sells electric cars. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's got dealers deeply worried. Ford says it's still going to use its dealers. But where do you think this is going? Well, you know, we actually talk a little bit about this in, in, in our book, John, on, on dealer franchise laws. And one of the things that we also tried to do was bring in an international perspective. And in our discussion about dealer franchise laws internationally, the experience of manufacturer owned dealerships in Europe, um, as you may recall, didn't bode so well when the manufacturers tried to own and run dealers, principally because that dealerships, when they're run by manufacturer reps, reps didn't produce as much um, entrepreneurship um, as independently owned franchise dealers. That was the experience that was in, I believe, in the 90s. Um, where there was some forays into uh, directly owned dealerships. What we're talking about now is a little bit different, right? Because they're, we're not talking about in, uh, dealer, um, dealerships owned by manufacturers, but rather manufacturers selling directly without any dealership. And so um, this is new territory. And as Carl mentioned, this is really a, a, has turned into a political issue. But I looked at it more from the financial uh, perspective of how this worked in the past to see whether that made sense financially. And um, and, and when, when it came to manufacturers owning dealers financially, it didn't really work out well, um, at least in Europe. And so we're in new new territory here, as Carl mentioned, with, with a lot of the EV and the new auto startups. It, it just remains to be seen, um, frankly, over the long term, whether that is the, the best viable model for manufacturers or, or, or not. It's, 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 it's still un, unclear. Mm hmm you know, speaking of EVs, there's also autonomous vehicles coming. There's over-the-air updates. You guys cite uh, a number of future or new technologies that are coming that are probably going to precipitate even more laws. Uh, Carly, you're going to have to write a follow-up to this book in a couple of years. Yeah, quite possibly, quite possibly. But you know, I think I think what we are seeing, you know, from a, from a legal and in a particular a regulatory perspective on, you know autonomous vehicles and EVs and things like that is, is it's not so much new laws and regulations, but, but it's really the regulators are trying to take the existing laws and regulations and sort of expand, you know, the concepts and, and adapt them to these newer applications. And so my, my guess is, you know, you're, you're not going to see, you know, major groundbreaking change, but, but it'll be much more sort of incremental and it'll be consistent with, uh, you know, where, where we've been kind of historically mm -hmm. um, but but it is very interesting because it does create you know it, it you know automotive the you know, autom out of automotive law and regulation you know is it's very different um than you know the laws and regulations that apply to like your traditional software company for example and that's also part of you know one of the what, what we do with our clients is you know, as, as they're looking to enter into the automotive space that, you know, they need to understand how highly regulated it is. Um, and that's, that's surprising for some people, I would say. Um, again, you know, we've got the book and we can, here you go, take a look at this, but this, this is the world that you're living in now. 
Mm -hmm. John, there may be a need to combine automotive law with aviation law if you think about flying cars, right? Because the, if you really want to look into the future and if we think we're going to have a Jetsons one day, that's really where you've got a lot of legal uh, maneuvering to, 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 to sort through when it comes to flying through, through airspace and parking in airspace and parking in cities and who's got rights to park the flying car where they want to and, and so on. Um, we didn't we didn't touch on that in this book, but that could be the uh, the, the follow up. Yeah, well, you know, it sounds like you're setting up a battle between the FAA and NHTSA yeah, as to who's going to write the regulations right. for these things. <laughs> right, right, and of course, the states and the local ordinances and all of that they all have to they're, they're all going to have a say as well. So it's you've got the federal, you've got the state, you've got the local, and probably one or two of them I'm missing. Yeah, it, it, it's extraordinary. It, Carl, is the automotive industry the most heavily regulated industry out there? I don't know if I would say it's necessarily the most heavily regulated, but but it is very heavily regulated. I mean, if you think about it, so this is an interesting thing about this. That, you know, I, I'm sort of a history buff, kind of a history nerd, and so uh, you know, you know, looking at this whole situation from a consumer perspective, consumer protection stamp perspective, you know, in the U.S., you know, our our consumer protection regulations started showing up, laws and regulations show, started showing up with state laws and regulations around food, and you know, milk purity laws and things like that. Then very quickly thereafter, uh, you know, we, we ended up with you know, regulation around uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals, again, public safety. Um, and you've all, always had, you know, highly, high, you know, well, not always, but we, we have a highly regulated, um, you know, financial services industry as well. Again, all of this is coming out of situations where there has been either you know macroeconomic harm or, or significant harm to indiv you know to people and then as you know automotive automotive you know, automobiles became much more prevalent in the early and early 20th century uh, you know they're dangerous they're expensive uh, and you know we, we started seeing a lot of really con consumer protection legislation there so i you know yeah i think you know food food drugs you know financial services automotive you know healthcare you know any of these in economic sectors where there is a high risk of harm to people. Um, it, 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 they're very highly regulated. So yeah, it's, it's, it is a highly regulated industry. Um, Kevin, you know, your thought, is it too regulated? I mean, is this a burden or is it worth it because it's protecting consumers? It's good for lawyers, John. And, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, look, it, it, it is it is highly regulated. Auto and auto finance are both highly regulated industries. Are they the most regulated? I don't know, but I'd certainly put it up there. What's interesting, just as an anecdote, and Carl, the history buff will know this, you may know this, John, in, in the late 50s and early 60s, the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate held hearings and had bills before them that they didn't act on that would have divested General Motors from GMAC um, that, because there was so much concern and, would have, and also would have pro prohibited any automaker from having a captive finance company. Um, and this goes back to the 50s. And mm -hmm. that shows you the concern that at least the federal regulators had. Uh, going going way back. Um, and that's continued. I mean, we've had a number of congressional hearings over the years into all kinds of, of auto things, not just related to auto and auto finance or antitrust. Think of the Ford Firestones, think of the Pinto hearings, think of the Corvair hearings, think of, I mean, on and on you can go. Um, so I would absolutely put auto and auto finance in, in certainly in the top, um, you know, industries that are highly regulated. Be very interesting to find a, a dollar amount that you could apply to all the laws and regulations. It, it's got to be a big number. Well, we were talking earlier, right? If, if, if there's 30,000 parts for the car, I would say there's 30,000 laws of, uh, applying to each car, <laughs> roughly speaking. And I, I don't, I've never quantified what that would be. It'd be a big, big number for sure. Yeah. So as I said, the, the, the book is called Automotive Law 101. Where can you find it? What does it cost? C uh, Carl, you want to tackle that? So it is, it is out there on Amazon. And I'll be honest with you, I don't recall off the top of my head what the, what the, what the list price of it is. Um, but, but, it is but it is available on you know, Amazon. Yeah, I think yeah. and also through the publisher, Lawyers and, Judge, Lawyers and Judges Publishing. Yeah. Uh, it's also directly available through, through uh, the publisher as well. And it's $73. $73. I got to tell you, you know, uh, that price might shock somebody who was thinking about it. But I got to tell you, I, I am so glad I've got a copy of this book because it's going to be in a very valuable resource for me as I report on things. It, it's just so easily written. It's well indexed. You, it, it's going to be easy be for me to uh, define any topics. But uh, 
Kevin, what's next for you guys? Like I said, I, is, you, you're contemplating the idea of a second book or no? No, I think we're looking at a different one where we look at the biggest automotive law, legal cases in the history of the automotive industry and their impact, not just on the auto industry, but in the legal history itself. So what were some of the biggest cases to come out of auto that have an impact across the board in, in all sectors of society? That's kind of, I think, the next project. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sounds fascinating. So, Carl, are you going to start with the Selden patent? Way back actually, <laughs> actually, that that is actually, one of, that is one of my articles that uh, I have a draft of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and again, these the, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to make do a similar sort of approach. We're trying to make this very accessible and, and sort of relevant to people. I mean, you know, each each of these articles is you know, you know two thousand words or so, so they're they're pretty short. We have pictures so, of this one. Just so the audience knows, Selden is a guy who patented the automobile back uh, around the, the turn of the 20th century and forced every automaker to pay him a royalty on every vehicle that they made until Henry Ford came around and said, the heck with that, I'm not paying you a penny. Selden sued. And the way Ford was able to settle the suit was he forced Selden to build his car according to his patent and it didn't work. I right. mean, I'm giving you the shorthand here, right? And the judge threw it out of court. Right. Yeah, it, it, it's a, that's a very, it's a very interesting case. Um, because and we're, we're real quick here. I need a quick one. Answer. Sure. Oh, it's just, it's, it's an early case of sort of what they call a non-practicing entity in the IP world. So it's, it's very, it's very important to patent law in the U.S. as well. Gotcha. Can't wait till the next one comes out. I think you guys have got a terrific topic there. But Kevin McDonald, Carl Hockheimer, thank you so much for coming on today's show. Oh, thank, thank you, you for having us. Auto Line This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode.